I'm going to continue reading from the uh, practice instructions of the great Zen master Hongji. Even though I think that it's very difficult for the postmodern ego to appreciate these instructions. They're beautiful prose poems, but the subtlety of what they are expressing I think passes por alta, as they say. I don't think the ego can retain it. And it's important to notice that if that is the case and learn from that if one cannot learn from the text itself. Because the postmodern ego in its final phase of morphing into... Uh, into a state in which it is polarized against liberation, against its own best interests. It, it can't, not only is it incoherent, but it, it is not able to recognize its own incoherence. And incoherence becomes its new logic, its new normal. And coherence itself becomes a threat in the same way that the bliss of the self is always present, but it's perceived by the ego as anxiety. And so the ego cannot possibly hold on to the desire for liberation because it simply increases its anxiety. And why does it get anxious? Because the ego is requiring for its stability within its incoherence of a tremendous and ongoing input of jouissance. And the more that one goes toward the egoless polarity, the less intense becomes one's experience of the world because there's less suffering, but there's also less enjoyment of that suffering. And the lack of enjoyment becomes a crisis at a certain point. And it leads to a need to act out in order to get some immediate gratification that reinforces the ego and says, yes, the ego is my reality. I'm grounded in it. And, and it is able to avoid the anxiety of the threat of the unknown and the infinite. And yet, the, there is not a sufficient capacity to recognize that the ego is not oneself. There is such an automatic reflexive identification with the thoughts that pass through the mind that, that the consciousness cannot awaken to the fact that those thoughts are alien. They are a usurpation by an external force that has been internalized imposed upon your consciousness and is impersonating yourself and operating as a, a system of thinking that serves the other. But because this cannot be realized, uh, the, the ego will, the, the, the consciousness will immediately side with those thoughts and attempt to uh, enact their desire to escape whether to escape geographically or to escape by taking a drug or to escape by changing one's situation and uh, establishing a dependence upon a different object, whatever it is that the jouissance is composed of, the ego will gravitate toward that uh, as its, uh, its security even though it makes it ever more insecure, more dependent, more uh, dense in its identification with the body. But it will fool itself into thinking that that density is actually a, uh, an, an event of liberation from its anxiety about its unknownness to itself. And it will it will have a, a comfort zone within a limited frame of reference in which there is a margin of unpredictability, 
but within very known uh, uh, parameters, as uh, let's say in, in a relationship in which one has some volatile erotic transmission of energies, or in an ayahuasca ceremony, or in some kind of, or even taking cannabis, any kind of an immediate uh, shift of frequency, but that can be contained within the ego's frame of reference, will give it a, a, a kind of a breather in which uh, it, it is able to sustain then its own egoic narrative at a slightly higher level of temporary coherence, but that will soon uh, split off into a number of separate reality tunnels that will soon lead it into an inconsistency such that it once again becomes so confused that it cannot recognize its confusion. And that's the state uh, of the tamasic bedrock of the ego, that, that it, it has to remain completely asleep to its own infinite nature. And it, it, it is able to fall asleep under the assumption that that sleep is its awakening. And that that stunted stagnation is actually growth. It's a fascinating thing when you study it. So on page 31, the next, we're, we're going in order of, in how they are placed in the book. Contemplating the 10,000 years. Patch-robed monks make their thinking dry and cool and rest from the remnants of conditioning. Okay, so the first thing, eliminate all the conditioned responses to reality, the conditioned narratives, the usual way of thinking, the usual cynicism, the usual uh, way of diverting from the, the intention of realizing the self. So the thinking has to be dry and cool, no emotion, no hot and wet, kind of uh, 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 self-stimulating erotic fantasies or angry tantrum-like thoughts, but able to see everything as it is without judgment. Persistently brush up and sharpen this bit of the field. Okay, so before you do anything else, if you do not achieve the ability to stay dry and cool, you cannot take your process any further than that. You can't do this when there are any hot emotions going on. You have to be in a state of detachment from the ego and its uh, constant brewing up of a, of, of a new uh, uh, desire for some kind of enjoyment that will bring it back into body consciousness. Directly cut through all the overgrown, overgrown grass, a nice metaphor, the weeds of the mind that are constantly growing, that are causing you to lose the trail to the river of life. So reach the limit in all directions without defiling even one atom. Okay, the limit of the mind's thinking. Go beyond the limit of its frame of reference. Push the envelope and then open the envelope and get out of it. You have to go beyond the limit, but you have to go beyond the limit without defiling yourself along the way. Because if there is one self-defiling thought, that will make you believe you are unworthy of going beyond the limit. It's a self-limiting way that the ego maintains its homeostasis by short-circuiting the process of transcending itself. Spiritual and bright, vast and lustrous, illuminating fully what is before you, Directly attain the shining light and clarity 
that cannot attach to a single defilement. Immediately tug and pull back the ox's nose. Okay, do you remember those ox herding pictures, those 10 pictures of the Zen process? He's got to find the ox, ride it, bring it home, tame it, right? Well, pulling the ox's nose is the first act of taming the ox, and the ego is the ox, right? The ox is not going to lead you astray. It's not going to think. It's not going to pull you into a diversion from the self. You have become the master over the ego. You have to take control over it. Of course, his horns are imposing. Don't be afraid of the ego. He's not going to hurt you. Uh, and he stomps around like a beast. Yet, he never damages people's sprouts or grain. In other words, the ego will not be able to reach what is good and real and true within you. So don't worry about getting hurt by it, but don't allow its uh, apparent force and bestiality to overcome your, uh, your right to self-mastery. Wandering around, accept how it goes. And accepting how it goes, wander around. Okay, very important principle. Don't uh, uh, don't assume you have that that the 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 closest uh, way to between two points is a straight line. You actually will only get to the goal of liberation through wandering, without a goal. The goal is goallessness because it's not somewhere in the future, it's not somewhere else than you are now. It is the wandering in a state of total presence that enables you to be in the noumenal at the same time as the apparent wandering in the phenomenal becomes realized as only a dream by the unchanging consciousness that no longer depends upon or identifies with the phenomenal plane. And once you recognize that you're not in a material world, that all of this is light, but it's perceived as a material world because the frequency of consciousness has fallen too low to understand the true nature of where we are and what we are, once there is a freedom from the judgments and the, uh, the belief system of the ego because you have tamed the ox not to keep producing its narrative, then you will be able to wander through the labyrinth of consciousness and at the same time recognize it simply as a field of light, of luminous splendor that is actually the emanation of the, the God-self itself. <laughs> <laughs>